ayes have it. And Dr. Wilson Norman, I will kick it off to you to get us started, if that's all right. Very good. Our first presentation today is on English as a Second Language, and we're excited to share some of the work that is happening with our multi-language learners and our ESL department. And so I'll invite the team to join me at the table um, as we walk through an overview of English as a Second Language. Let's see here. Can I click a bit more work? We'll take care of it. Okay. So I'm going to see what's going on with our slides. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. Good afternoon, um, board chair, board vice chair, board members, um, Superintendent, Taylor, Superintendent Taylor and his absence and others joining us today. Um, my name is Dr. Shanika Moore Lawrence and I'm the proud senior director of K-12 Academic Enhancement. And our team is grateful to have the opportunity to share some of our work with you today. Um, joining our discussion, there'll be several members from our team who will introduce themselves as we go through the presentation. Our desired outcomes include share an overview of the multilingual Title III programming, outline the eligibility criteria highlighting essential qualifications for program participation, and share the WCPSS multilingual student data to assess the success and impact of current programming. Our work is aligned to the several um, aspects of the strategic plan. Uh, deliver standards-based, rigorous, culturally responsive, inclusive curriculum resources and instructional practices that are enhanced by technology, and also analyze performance data to guide core instructional planning and high-impact interventions and acceleration. It's with great pleasure that I now turn it over to Valeria Murray, who is our ESL director. She will share a programmatic overview and some spotlights from the field. Valeria? Thank you very much, Dr. Moore um, board. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you information about our multilingual learners program. As required by the Office of Civil Rights, the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice and the NC State Board of Education, the English as a Second Language program for multilingual learners serves students who have been identified as multilingual learners on the designated state assessment of English language proficiency. A continuum of English language development services is provided by ESL teachers and other staff for all identified multilingual learners. Let's look at the ESL Department two-prong approach of support. Through instructional support, we serve students identify as multilingual learners. We offer a continuum of English language development support and models for students to attain English proficiency and meaningful participation in classes, as well as academic support to ensure MLs meet academic standards. The Center for International Enrollment supports the home language survey process, fosters a sense of belonging and aids integration into school community, facilitates the English language proficiency identification process, and also facilitates interpretation of international academic information. The goal of the ESL program is to ensure English language development support so that multilingual learners succeed in mainstream classes. The services are divided according to students' needs. The comprehensive level of service is usually for students in year one or two of your schooling. Students at this level require extensive scaffolding and modifications. The goal at this level is to connect to grade level ELA standards while building foundational academic skills. The moderate level of service is usually for students in years three or four in their US schooling. The students at this level require moderate scaffolding and modifications. And the goal of this level is to accelerate language development by extending connections. The transitional level of service is usually for students in year five or more in the US school. And students at this level require some language scaffolding. 
the goal at this level is to expand academic language development to accelerate the application of increasingly complex linguistic skills. As I mentioned before, most of these services are rendered by ESL teachers in the schools. So this brings me to uh, the topic of allocation of mass of employment for our ESL teachers. I'd like to share a summary of the last three years of the multilingual learner headcount data in our district. In 2021, we had 15,403 multilingual students in our headcount. That number informed the, the mass of employment for the year 2022. But by the, the year 2022, we had already reached 17,365 students. Those 17,365 students informed the months of employment for this year, 23-24. But at this point, we have already surpassed, surpassed 20,000 multilingual students in our district. As you can see, we've been operated at a big deficit of months of employment for several years. So let's see the impact of mass employment allotment distribution on student progress. Through ML data analysis, we have concluded that the level of services provided to students in comprehensive and moderate level, that is between one year to four years of schooling in US, are meeting progress expectations for the ML subgroup. We have also concluded that the progress expectations for students in year five or more of instruction in a U.S. school have not exited the program as expected and they have not met um, consistent progress. So uh, looking at the year 24-25 and looking at our focus, taking this data into account, the ESL department's focus for 24-25 is to continue building the capacity of ESL teachers around the three fundamental pillars of the ESL teacher's role. As language specialists, providing uh, professional learning to support content teachers in their building to ensure multilingual students succeed in mainstream classes. As collaborators, partnering in professional learning communities for in-class support, co-teaching, extending shelter instruction, modern lessons, among others. And advocating for multilingual learners to enroll in AP, honors, and advanced programs through awareness of grading criteria and active involvement in IEP meetings and retention discussions. At this moment, I have the pleasure of introducing the spotlights from the field. So let's welcome Dr. Vonda Martin, Principal Yes Mill Elementary School, uh, Ms. Patty Edwards, Assistant Principal of Wake Forest High School, and also we're going to hear from Ms. Bonnie Mwanda, Principal of News River Middle School, who are going to talk about how these roles are exemplified in their schools. Ms. Bonda, okay. Martin. All right. Um, good, good afternoon, everybody, um, to our board members and Superintendent Taylor and staff. Yes, I'm Vonda Martin Jenkins. I'm the proud principal of Yates Mill Elementary, your neighbors. Um, we're about five minutes away. You all are big on community engagement. Please know that you have an open invitation to visit our campus at any time. So Yates Mill is the home to 521 students. 32% um, of our students are MLs. 180 students of 520. So we have a healthy um, ML population and um, our numbers are continuing like a lot of other schools to increase. Uh, last year we had 137 um, MLs and so we are jumping up, um, getting close to 200. And um, with only two teachers serving uh, 180 students, we knew that the approach we had to take was to build capacity across the staff, right? Because two people could, cannot shoulder and uh, meet the needs of all of those students. So today, um, I have with me Meg Johnson. She's one of our ESL uh, teachers, and she's going to speak about how we are building capacity to support those 180 um, ML students at Yaseville. Meg? Thank you, Dr. Jenkins. Uh, so, like she said, my name is Meg Johnson. I'm the ESL, one of the two ESL teachers at Yates Mill, um, and we definitely have a heavy lift with our ESL population that's continued to grow. 
Um, one of the ways that we support our students is as a language specialist, I'm really looking closely at our WIDA access data, which is our language proficiency data, um, and utilizing that strategically. Um, so I actually work with the students to analyze their own growth and to set personal goals each year. Um, we've also used what I've learned in the WIDA 2020 framework trainings that I participated in last year through our district ESL um, team to create student-friendly rubrics so that they can really be aware of how they're learning and growing and then sharing these rubrics this year with our classroom teachers. Uh, this year I was invited to participate in each grade level's spring collaboration day. We're really fortunate that each team is able to meet for a full day of collaborative planning and I was invited to come and be a part of that. And we did a data dig into our students' um, WIDA access data. And what we saw is that students are tending to get stuck um, in that moderate level. Like we talked about, they're not making the growth that they need to, especially in their expressive language skills of speaking and writing. So we looked at each student in that grade level's um, progress on their scores and helped the teachers to analyze to see where their students fell and then to look at the actual standards, the WIDA language standards, and see how they are actually addressing those standards in their classroom instruction. Um, and they saw a lot of connections between their language arts um, standards and the work that they're doing in their classroom and the standards that students are being held to on their language proficiency testing as well. Um, and they really appreciate the opportunity to be more informed uh, about how our students are graded each year on their language development, and it was very eye-opening for our teachers. Um, and again, it, it really helped to build that collaboration that it's not just, oh, Ms. Johnson takes the kids and does all their language learning. Mm -hmm. Because not only would that not be best for the students, it's not possible with the numbers that we have and then the needs of our students. And that's not how we do language. Um, the other part of my role that we've tried to really improve is as an advocate. Um, and that's through um, a program that we've developed called Sweet Strategies. So every month, um, the, the ESL team, myself and our other ESL teacher, choose a high yield instructional strategy that benefits multilingual learners. Um, we put a little piece of candy in their mailbox with a little blurb about the strategy. That's why it's called Sweet Strategies. <laughs> but that also has an invitation to come to an optional professional learning session before and after school, where we actually model and teach the teachers how to implement that strategy in their classrooms to better benefit their multilingual learners. Um, some of the topics that we've covered over the past two years with this program are understanding the needs of newcomers and helping newcomers to feel welcome in the classroom. Um, we've done a program on how to activate your background knowledge, which is a really important strategy for multilingual learners. We've done one on increasing the amount of student talk in your classroom and decreasing the teacher talk to provide opportunities for students to speak in class. Um, I did a session all about different types of writing scaffolds that you can use because a lot of teachers ask for support with writing for our multilingual learners. Um, and then also we did a session on the use of translanguaging, which is the idea that students can access their home language in the classroom um, to help them develop their overall language proficiency. And again, a lot of these sessions were very eye-opening for classroom teachers because not only did they see um, that they were starting to use some of this already, they just needed to fine-tune it, but also a lot of the strategies that are good for our multilingual learners benefit all students. So building the capacity of teachers to support MLs it increases the academic achievement for all students in your classroom. Thank you, Meg. Mm -hmm. We appreciate Thank it. You. <clears throat> and now we're going to go to Wake Forest High School, Ms. Patty Edwards. Hi. Good afternoon. Thank you for having us here. Um, my name is Patty Edwards. I'm the Assistant Principal for Instruction at Wake Forest High School. Not your neighbor, far out at the other end. And I've brought one of our ESL teachers, Melanie Soto, with me today. Um, I want to kind of tell you a story of how this school year has evolved because this is not how we started out with intention, but it's where we've kind of evolved to. So like so many other schools, we have been working to close that achievement gap um, and really close up the achievement between our marginalized populations and our non-marginalized populations. Um, especially our MLs, as Valeria, Valeria pointed out, we have way more than we have in the past. They just keep growing, so that's a huge um, population that we want to make sure we're meeting their needs. So in the fall, I, being very passionate about our ML students, attended one of Valeria's trainings, and she was going over 
something I already knew, but just wasn't kind of in the forefront of my mind, and that's how the access testing impacts our accountability, the percentage it counts for, and how our ML students are counting kind of twice as they count in the other subgroups, or excuse me, the other subjects as well. So in thinking about that and being the person over testing and data and accountability at the school, I started thinking about how teachers feel about access testing and how we need them to feel about access testing. Um, unfortunately, access testing historically doesn't have a positive connotation. Teachers are frustrated by it. I don't know how much you know about the access testing, but students are pulled at least three times to get their testing done. One time for a practice test, one time to do reading and listening, or two times, once for reading and once for listening, and then once for speaking and writing. So they're pulled out of instructional time, and these are our most vulnerable kids. They're the ones that need the instruction. So teachers have been frustrated. So I wanted to get them to be more um, encouraging and on board with the access testing to encourage the students. Another issue we run into is at the high school level, many of these kids have seen this test year after year, and they're frustrated with it. So my intention was to become a cheerleader for access. So we started planning, and as I started to plan, I found out that the only people that knew what was on the access test were the ESL teachers, myself, and the students. The rest of the staff had no idea, including, which shocked me, our shelter teachers. So I refocused our energy, and I said, okay, instead of just being a cheerleader, they're gonna see what the access test looks like. So we, at our staff meetings, we do them by period, we did the practice test for each subgroup with all the teachers. So they got to see and feel what the kids do. And it was, it truly was one of my favorite sessions because, that I've ever done because the aha moments from teachers were just amazing. Mm -hmm. They started calling out, oh, I could use Talking Tuesdays in my class every Tuesday and have the kids talk. And they started shouting ideas and they became very engaged with it, which I thought I was going to be kind of dragging them through it. And they really became interested and engaged in it. So we started with that. We had the sheltered team create a list of ideas that were generated at that meeting, as well as some other ideas. And that's where I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Soto to pick up and tell you about some of those strategies that we've worked into our curriculum. Um, I'm Melanie Soto. I'm one of the ESL teachers at Wake Forest. And um, <coughs> through the shelter team this year, um, we have been given encouragement and the go ahead with our admin to take time, about 10 minutes, um, maybe a little longer at each staff meeting per month to go over a strategy that um, would be beneficial for an ML in their classroom. Um, and we've had a shelter teacher lead that each time so that they're not just seeing the ESL face um, and and um, putting that together, but that they're seeing a content teacher also provide that. And so some of those right now have been um, translation um, because at our high school level, they're getting all this content, all the vocabulary. Um, the majority of them are reading in their first or second language. And so we have been doing translation PDs at our um, staff meetings. And so we've done that for the first one, and the second one we did um, just academic vocabulary and how that's so important, but also what kinds of things you can add in with those vocabulary. Um, visuals being a big one, especially for um, students who may have interrupted education. Um, they have to add that non-linguistic representation with the word because they're not going to know what an A or a B or a C is. Um, and so that's kind of where we've gone with our PDs. We're looking at what other strategies we're going to be implementing um, and presenting to staff in the next couple of staff meetings as we finish out the year. Um, but that's kind of what we're doing strategy-wise. And then through the shelter team, we're kind of hoping to not just that, but there's so many other things. Just connect the community, connect the parents with this so that they understand um, kind of where their students are. So we have a family night plan for next week. Um, we are in Wake Forest, and so it is far for parents to get to us because we have students coming from Raleigh. 
And so East Millbrook has graciously, um, East Millbrook Middle School has graciously let us use their facility. We're going to be meeting there next week for family night. And we've already had some parents um, respond. So we're excited to see um, how we can get them involved in their learning as well, um, as well as the content teachers at our school. Because um, one of the PDs that we did this year with the ESL department, one of the ladies said, they're not your students. They're our students. They're everyone's students. So I can't just say my student. No, 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 no. Like the schools, mm -hmm. the county students. Yes. Um, Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. <laughs> and um, we're going to go now to Miss River Middle School. And I want to. Just remind you that we have three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> three minutes. All right. so we have a lot of great things uh, happening in ESL, but I know that we need to. Okay. Alrighty. So I'm Lonnie Mwanda, the very, 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 very proud principal of Peace River Middle School. I've been there now for seven months and a couple of days. So I'm joined here by Ms. Hara. She is our lead ESL teacher. We're going to kind of go back and forth. What you have in that folder just kind of aligns the work that we're doing in our building. So we'll kind of go through that with you. I promise in three minutes or less. So I'll hand over to Ms. Hara, but we'll be going back and forth. Okay. Okay. Thank you <laughs> <laughs> for the invitation to present and to show us, uh, I mean, to be able to show you our achievement projects and projections for the next year as well. Um, well, we mentioned that we teach middle schoolers, people usually express admiration, fear, <laughs> astonishment. <laughs> we know that. We are aware of the special kind of resilience required to teach middle schoolers. The reality is that middle school is indeed challenging for us, it is, but it's also a stage filled with incredible opportunities for growth and connection. And that's where we as a team, we have taken this challenge and we align to the three objectives of the ESL department and the role of the ESL coordinator. We have shared vision of working collaborative with the district to make sure that multilingual learners will receive equitable access to rigorous standards and meaningful learning experiences. So I'll echo what the other um, speakers have said about we need more support, our numbers are growing, all of those things are still true in our building as well. That second slide you have there just shows the breakdown of our student population. We're about 25% ESL students. The big thing for us is that many of them are what we call experienced MLs. So we're having to figure out what do we do to move them out of the program because they've been here long enough and what are we doing, what can we do better and different to better serve those students. So what we have here for you is um, last week at our principals meeting, we learned about the new learning framework for the district. So what we've done is we've aligned our work with the district framework, with the ESL framework, so you can see how it all comes together. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, so under um, advocate or see me, we're, we're here to advocate for our students, obviously. So we'll just speak briefly about what we're doing. A couple of things are, I've been there for seven months so far, and one thing that we weren't seeing is that our students weren't really being seen in the building. So like our announcements are done Spanish and English. Our kids need the announcements now. We did hire a bilingual clerical staff um, back in January, and she has served our families um, amazingly well, I would say. There have been many instances that we did not have Miss Jaylene we'd have been at a loss, right? And one mom came in terrified for her son. We just moved here. I was like, well, ma'am, I got somebody can help you. She left. She stopped crying. She was good, right? So that's been major for us. We did have 39 students to attend the Hispanic Summit at NC State the other week, which was pretty amazing. Ms. Harlow went with them for that. We have a hotels partnership that we're looking to figure out how we do better with that next year. And then we're also doing the level up tutoring with Dr. Moore's um, office. For next year, though, we've learned that we will not be a part of the grant for hotels for next school year. So so for future programming, how do we pay for that, number one? And then number two, that program serves our eighth graders, but we recognize that Ms. Hart can speak too. We can't just start with eighth grade to begin serving our students. It's got to start, well, for us, sixth grade, right? So we're looking at how do we um, create programming to serve our grades six through eight students. I find that that program actually changed the mindset of students. They usually at middle school make up their mind that when they go to high school, they know they're going to be two or three years and they are able to drop off from that. So ideally, opening opportunities for them, it actually widens the idea that they might be able to do something different. That the reason why they're exposed to these learning opportunities, juntos, being able to have a safe space to share their culture, to make connections, and to dignify their historical and rich background. Because they're multilingual doesn't mean that they're, and we are measuring them in their English proficiency, doesn't mean that they know less. It means that they are learning a language, what they are 
actually proficient in another. Mm -hmm. So coming back to that space and building from there a connection for them to think ahead and think of and plan for the future, it starts in middle school. Mm -hmm. So the next one talks about challenge me, right? And then the language specialist role that she plays. So we do provide support through sheltered instruction to our social studies and science courses currently. But our plan is to expand that. Like I said, I've been there for seven months, so we're having to build in steps. So we are um, ensuring that over the summer with our summer planning that we are providing proper support to our shelter courses. But we're looking again to expand that, which kind of goes back to the need for more support in our schools. We have 2.5 teachers. I'd love to have, I don't know, three or four. Um, so, you know, to be able to do that with fidelity. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> All right, so next we have um, Engage Me with um, the collaborator role that Ms. Hara plays. So one thing we've been working on with that is similar to what Patty, my friend, um, what Patty said in our um, earlier was just that, you know, what do we do with the, what we're given and then how do we modify that for our ESL students. So uh, Karen also works with Steve in his office and we talked about like the three read strategy. How does that look for our ESL students? So Karen has so graciously given us what that could look like for our ESL students. So our plan is to continue that work as well for next school year. Like here are our strategies, but again, how are we gonna modify and scaffold that to meet the needs of our ESL students? Perfect. Uh, we also, I mean, just to mention a little bit more about that, um, our school offers the three levels ESL one to advance and also shorter learning. But our data is showing that our students are growing, not exiting year yet there. So ideally, we still work in and continue monitoring those students who have become independent, but it's still not exit the service. We still provide help, we still provide uh, with access testing training before the test for them to be ready to be um, prepared emotionally, psychologically, and actually training the strategies just to cope with that test. And knowing that we know that our students come from traumatized situation, um, not discontinued education in some cases, and we still try to build that um, emotional strength to cope with these situations. And then the last focus focuses on know me and in the collaborator role. So we looked at that as collaborating with colleagues, but also with students because well, it's kind of their education. So one thing that we did work on this year was just increasing student voice and what that testing looks like for them. So I think probably about my second month, we talked to the kids and say like, you know, we're not exiting the program, tell us more, right? And they said, you know, sometimes when we're testing in a huge setting, I don't really want to speak in front of the people that I don't know, so can we have smaller testing sessions, which with the help of some of our central office friends, central services, sir, they came out and they helped us out to have smaller set, you know, smaller testing sessions. So we're looking at how do we share, like Patty said, with the staff, what does the testing mean, what does it look like, but then also including student voice in those decisions, and that is all for us. Did you have anything to add? No. Thank you so much. All right, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. That is the end of the ESL presentation. This time we'll open it up for questions. We hope you heard a lot about some of the strategies um, going on in our ESL department to support our multilingual learners and recognizing that no learner is exactly the same and we have to have the same That's right. I want to thank the principals for sharing your time with us. I know it's an early start, yeah. uh, but thank you all for sharing the great things that are happening in your school each and every day and the support that you give, not only just to our students, but to their families as well, because when your families are engaged, students, uh, academics also thrive as well. So thank you all so much. Um, I see a couple of questions. We'll start with Mr. Hershey and then uh, Dr. Ingham Ms. Evans. At the beginning of the presentation, there were a number of, you listed a several different numbers of the population and maybe how that related to months of employment. That is correct. Uh, could you send that to us? Um, because just as a visual, and, and I would just encourage any staff that whenever we have anything that ties to months of employment, if there's any formulas, please have a good slide for it so it's better for anyone who's paying attention yes. to see it and so we can advertise how short staff we are in some of these situations. Absolutely. Thank yes, you. Dr. Thank you so much for the presentation. And um, you know, I'm I'm the recipient of ESL when I came um, from Hong Kong, and so I, I truly appreciate the efforts that people do to help um, uh, kids uh, uh, get um, proficient with the language um, and also be part of this you know 
uh, great society. Um, the question I have is, um, you know, you talked about the, the role, like having the, the parents be part of um, that and inviting them to, to be part of it. I think that's a very important piece of it, and I think for the parents to know um, what, how we're teaching the kids, and you know, because it's probably very different from what the country that they come from, and so I think it's important that they are engaged in that that process as well, and understanding what we do. Um, the, the question I have is, um, are there ways to kind of um, get people in different times of the day? I, you know, because there's so many people that are working at different times of the day, and, and how do you, get, you know, get more people involved in, you know, and accommodate their schedules? I think, yes. Yeah. Uh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think for us, actually having that bilingual staff person has been beneficial for us so that we are available to support our parents at any given point. Like the one mom that I mentioned, she came in in the morning, like it was like morning arrival, buses are coming in, right? But Jaylene could at least get her started to say, okay, I'm here to help you, right? And then when she got the information to call me or someone else in to support the parents. So really, for us, having that bilingual staff person has played a big role in just whenever parents show up, I had one father say, well, um, she called me, I said, no, so I'll call you back today because it was my job, right? But I had someone that was able to kind of help me get the conversation started rather than him having to wait until the next thing to hear from me. She could call him back on that day and get his issue to um, address that day. I can add something to that. Uh, as regards to family engagement events, mm -hmm. we start changing like on Saturday mornings, Fridays, and also at certain points before the EOGs, before the with access testing, we invite the parents to come with the kids and see that we explain to them what is the purpose. I mean, to do um, an understanding of the scores, understanding of what we're going to be working the next weeks. And that helps them to understand and also to become allies with us when it comes to, okay, today you have the reading, you have to concentrate, you have to do, sit down and answer the questions and do this. I mean, they understand the process that the student's going through and help us or remind the students what they will have to be doing. I'm talking about the test, uh, the testing like EOGs and the access testing, but the family engagement events have been um, changing according or just to accommodate the parents' uh, working schedule. Right. Yeah. Thank you so and much. Also, just to throw in there, we've done a few different events during the year, and we've purposely done them at different times because we knew we couldn't meet all of those. And we're also offering honor society kids coming to babysit and caretakers for the oh. smaller children so that the parents oh, can, can bring the children ones. Yeah. And it's also making phone calls like parent contact, not just during the school day. And I know that that is like, you know, outside our hours or whatever, <coughs> but we have a shelter teacher. He is bilingual and he's like, I'm going to go through and call everyone on Saturday because he knows that the family are going to be more likely to answer the phone at that point, um, especially to invite them to our um, family night next week. But it's just calling them outside of those hours. And sometimes I'll send a talking point or a message saying, hey, can I call you later? And so I'll call them too because I'm also bilingual. So it's just getting there as quick as we can, but set a time with the parent and it's worth it. Yeah, and through the Family Engagement District Initiative, um, one of the things that we always uh, need to take into account is that the schools are creating an environment that feels safe for the parents, so they are actually wanting to go and collaborate. It's not only if the time of the day is appropriate for the families to be available, but also to feel yeah. that they are wanted. Not as intimidating. Right, exactly. And so that's what they're doing, creating that culture in their schools where they, the parents feel safe and wanted. Thanks. Um, so I can put it together based on uh, what you've said today. I can, with the context, I understand what you mean. But this is the first time that I'm hearing the phrase sheltered learning, sheltered mm -hmm. teacher. Can you tell, tell me yes. more about that, please? Yeah. So the, the shelter instruction is based on the SIOP model, which is the shelter instruction observation and protocol, which is a model of instruction. Um, has been around for many years. And it is based for content subject areas. And so the teachers, content area teachers, are trained on scaffolding the information for students learning English as a second or other language. 
Um, so it pairs content with language development. So for example, if you are teaching science and you're going to compare cells, animal cells and uh, human cells, and so you're going to have your um, learning target, which is the content that you're going to teach, but also it has to be accompanied by a language objective because I need to make explicit the language that is needed to compare. So I need to teach superlatives, comparatives, I need to have sentence frames that says this cell is bigger than, uh, smaller than. So I have to explicitly teach the language with the content. And so we have several uh, schools that they have shelter courses. And so they shelter biology, <coughs> shelter math, shelter language arts. And so these strategies are being um, put in practice with students. Most of our, I think all of our classes are hybrid. So it has a, a certain percentage of ML students and regular population. Um, there are some models that it could be only uh, multilingual learners, but in Wake County we chose to have this hybrid because we feel that the students also learn from their peer experience. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then uh, just one more. Mm -hmm. sure. um, Principal Moanda, did you say, I might have, I hope I misheard you, you're in the HELPS program now and you won't be next year, did you say that? Yes, I met with the Hontos. Is it Hontos? No, Hontos. Helps. helps. I might have misheard you. I'm in Hontos. Hontos. Yeah. Okay. She said Hontos. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. All right, thank you. I think it's all helps. I know. Good question, Lynn. What am I? Yeah, Hontos is a Spanish word that means together, and it's um, a, a, a program that helps students to um, have experiences moving forward to college, career, so have that exposure because a lot of our students don't have that experience at home, and so prepare them to see that they have options when but they you finish. Won't get that next right. year. So, yeah, the grant that so I met with them. Yeah, yeah. Right. I met with them last week, and the grant won't cover middle school next year. It covers only high school next mm -hmm. year, so we're going to create our own hotels. Yes, you are. <laughs> and we will collaborate and we will create a Juntos <laughs> for middle school. Ms. Yes. Mahaffey? Um, I just want to say, first of all, thank you all for coming. Um, getting multiple language learners from multiple languages to feel comfortable in the target language of English is always difficult. Um, I do appreciate when we have bilingual front office staff um, because you can see the relief on our on our Spanish speaking family spaces when they have that and so my question is more for uh, a budget question I'm sorry Dr. Taylor but it's coming um, so do we have a supplement for bilingual front office staff whether it's a receptionist or the lead secretary or the data manager who, who can help those families because a lot of those times they're bringing a special skill set by being able to speak Spanish um, but they're not compensated, even though they're using that additional skill every day. And I say this as someone who worked in a call center bilingually and only got the same pay as everybody else. Um, and so I think that's something, if that's not happening for a future budget season, believe me, I'm not going to add that to the list. <laughs> but for a future budget season that I think we should look into because that is such a welcoming experience for so many of our families. Yeah, I, I am not aware of a budget item that addresses that, but I think it's absolutely something we need to look at. You can put a premium like that on those positions. We all know what that experience is like when you have uh, uh, multilingual families that come in and, and give them that, that access. I think right. it's absolutely what we need to do. And I know we can't do every language, but clearly we know what our higher languages are. I believe Spanish is probably the most popular, mm -hmm. so prevalent. We have a uh, almost 190 languages represented in the district. Yeah. Well, Ms. Mahaffey, actually, that was the sidebar that Ms. Johnson also and I had about compensating. Um, so we're, we're on the same page. Um, Ms. Rice. Well, that makes your three out of you. Oh, <laughs> yes, I can mark that off. Um, thank you all so very much for uh, such detailed presentations and passions that I can tell that you're doing within your um, schools um, is greatly appreciated and I know families are very thankful for it as well. Um, but I have a, my question is around uh, what these amazing schools are doing individually and so then I have to come and ask the district so 
in, in order to access um, across the district with our ML testing, how are we leveraging what these amazing people are sharing they had to create themselves within their own system, right? Their own school level, school base level. What are we doing on district wide? I'm sure that they're just not the only ones experiencing these same challenges. And then how are we looking at that through an equitable lens? I'm looking at where my schools are represented and then I'm looking at a district that I serve and I didn't, you know, I'm not hearing a, a sample of what they may be experiencing and if they're in a particular geographic area and they have to create um, methods to help them at our school base, then I can only imagine what we're looking at elsewhere. And then, so, so I guess I, I, may, I think I'm making sense of what are we doing equitably to make sure that these families, one, what I heard you say, which touched my heart, the dignity in what they're doing. Um, I'm gonna stick to what we're doing district-wide, excellence and equity, right? I will never forget that summit. It meant something. And so how are we looking at that through that lens across the district? What are we doing to ensure <coughs> on a level that from area superintendent to administration into the teaching staff that we're creating a culture of shared information to make sure that everybody is on the same page. And so that is my concern that I am, we may can't answer that today or right here, but I definitely will mm -hmm. do a circle back. I need to hear something about um, long term and what that looks like. I'd like to share with you, I think when you heard them share today about our new district-wide learning model, and it's a personalized model that really serves from the lens of students. And the first one is See Me, that we are really looking at how we build relationships with students and all of our professional learning, all of our curriculum would be aligned and infuse some of those pieces in that. So when we talk about uh, lowering the bar of establishing those relationships so it's not a scary situation for families or students to come into schools. And so that's that see me part. Challenge me is thinking about how are we providing access to every student, gifted as well as second language learner, EC student, no matter what your differences may be, how are we uh, addressing and designing the curriculum to meet your needs? And so as we looked at all of the strategies for EC students, um, ESL students, um, AIG students, that the strategies were the same. And so we're redesigning our curriculum as a baseline mm -hmm. for everyone to be able to use so that we have those strategies built within it. And then when we think about engage me, that goes back to those high yield strategies. What are our expectations that we want to see in every classroom in our school district? Mm -hmm. So not, you know, of course we want schools to use their, cre their creativity and make enhancements, but establishing a baseline expectation for every classroom is what we shared with our principals last week. And then know me, that we describe multi-language learners and not every child is the same. Some come with interrupted schooling. Some students may be learning a second language, but they're gifted in mathematics. And so thinking about how do we know each student based on the data that we see. And so that's the baseline model for every department, whether it's ESL, EC, AIG, uh, regular ed, that we're all centering around this personalized student learning model. So that's kind of our baseline support that we are anchoring everything that we're doing in academic advancement around that work. If, if I could add, um, with my, I have 27 years of experience in teaching ESL in North Carolina. And I can tell you that this model is what is gonna make the difference because as some of the teachers and the principals were sharing for many, many years, um, ML students was the ESL teachers are sole responsibility. But this model is bringing the sense of the school community and uh, making a, a, a place at the table for our ML students and our ML families. And that's what is gonna make the difference for our students, all of them, including ML students. That sounds fantastic. Supporting, fully supporting I, the model. Just one last question. I just, and so with all of that said, and I know you said you just, you guys have implemented this or shared it last week, mm -hmm. will we be able to come back at another time to hear data around the success of these implementations and what that looks like and how we can measure where students are actually achieving where we need them to be um, in transitioning um, 
into stronger um, English speakers? So I see Dr. Rose Norman shaking her head. Um, yes. So I, and I can't remember. I know uh, Vice Chair Johnson also and I met with uh, Dr. Rose Norman to map out all of next year. So I'm sure there's going to be opportunities to bring back a lot of these. Um, not just this particular topic, but other topics that have come back to give updates and, and reports out. So I'm sure it's going to be possible. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Um, so on the division of principals and assistant principals, we're on the um, ESL subcommittee. Mm -hmm. So we also, on our level, are working to share what we've done in our building with other administrators to kind of also, on our level, share the work that we're doing. And that meets monthly. Are there any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you all so much. Um, and I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Wilson, for our next topic. Very good. We want to share with you uh, extended learning opportunities. And extended learning may be how we connect with families, how we connect with students, how we're doing um, additional extended learning opportunities. And so we have a team with us here today who will join us um, to share our desired outcomes. That we want to share an overview of the extended learning opportunities with our K-12 academic advancement. We want to present important um, data to showcase the benefits and outcomes of our extended learning initiatives, as well as communicate the successes and challenges of the current program and share some upcoming events. So if you would join us at the table. We have a large group of people, so we can see in and out and trying to coordinate. So our first two presenters will come to the table and then they'll step back so the others can step up to get their presentation done. So again, we bring you greetings. Thank you so much for allowing us an opportunity to share um, about our K-12 Academic Enhancement Extended Learning Opportunities. Um, our desired outcomes, we've already shared those. Um, and this work is aligned to deliver standards-based, rigorous, culturally responsive, and inclusive curriculum resources, analyze performance data to guide core instructional planning and high-impact interventions and acceleration, and of course, empower our families and communities to partner in their children's learning and school improvement. Um, we're excited to highlight just a few of the K-12 Academic Enhancement Extended Learning Opportunities. As you can see on the screen, we're going to spotlight Indian education, family and community engagement, level up, high dosage tutoring, wake together, wake up and read, and AVID. I will now turn it over to Rebecca Locklear, who is our Indian Education Program Coordinator. Good afternoon. Again, my name is Rebecca Becky Locklear. I am the coordinator for Wake County Public School System of Indian Education. The WCPSS Indian Education Program is a federally funded Title VI grant open to American Indian students in grades K-12 who are enrolled or affiliated with federally recognized and state recognized tribes. For students to be enrolled in Indian Education Program, their parent or guardian must complete a federal 506 form and then show proof of tribal affiliation by showing a copy of birth certificate or tribal enrollment for the student or parent or grandparent. Uh, this year we have increased our numbers of enrolled students by 14.1% and we're still growing. The Indian Education Program is designed to offer academic and cultural opportunities for students. Some of the academic op opportunities have, that have been offered to students this year have been book club, where we allow students to pick different books. Um, then they come back and tell the other students about the book they read, what they liked, what they didn't like, and what if they could add or take away from the book. One of the books some of the students have read this year has been Fry Bread. The book tells the story of fry bread and gives a recipe in the back of the book for making it. One of our students and her grandmother made fry bread for their family at home and um, to eat, and she told us how much she enjoyed it, so some of the other kids in the group wanted to go home and read that book so they could make it too. One-on-one um, -on -one tutoring and ACT, SAT test prep is another way that we offer academic opportunities that help us, helps our students to reach their desired academic success. Some of our students um, 
are wanting to raise their grade level up, some of our students have done tutoring to maintain or get a better, clear understanding of what they're doing in school. They take it to the tutors and they help them to maintain their grades. Um, other academic opportunities the students attended this year have been the pharmaceutical science workshop at Campbell University and a STEM day at Cisco's RTP campus. At Campbell University, the students experimented with E. coli, where they turned E. coli fluorescent to make them glow under the microscope, and then they also did um, some test strips for another class that was coming in after them, because uh, you have to let it sit for like 24 hours. Cisco's Native American Network, or NAN, hosted STEM Day for our students at their RTP campus, which uh, was another awesome learning event. The students played the game where they first had to do coding to make the game work. Then they talked to a panel of American Indian employees who showed their paths that led to Cisco. Students took a tour of Cisco campus where they were shown where the employees work, relax, and work out and play. And the um, in-house arcade was a very big hit. <laughs> um, students ended the day with speed mentoring. Before attending, the students were asked to do a questionnaire which gave their mentors an idea of the areas in STEM that the students had interest in. And then they were put together with engineers who are currently working in those areas. Surprisingly, this was some of our students' favorite part of the STEM day. However, they all loved it when they were told the tablets that Cisco had provided for them to use was theirs to keep, along with a handheld game so that they could play. Um, it's, it's a STEM game. It's about the size of a credit card. They can download that one. It holds one game at a time. So they can download it on there, play it, but they have to do the coding in order to make the, the game work so that it just, it's not just the plug in and play. Um, both workshops were very much hands-on and students who attended absolutely loved it, both experiences. Cultural opportunities that are offered to students are important part of the grant as well. From the poster that students created back in November to beadwork class, to sip hot cocoa and paint, and our upcoming classes where students will be making their own ribbon skirts like the one I'm wearing or ribbon shirt like the one JD's wearing. Um, in the class each class that has cultural significance and ties to the individual students' creative thoughts and perspective, which with these um, classes, we always make sure that we tie in history of each activity that we're doing with them, the cultural relevance, and then we challenge each student to find their significant tribal history or ties to that uh, thing. Like, for example, with ribbon skirts, um, all ribbon skirts won't look the same. All ribbon shirts won't look the same. Um, the one I have on, I made, or had made, for a eagle feather ceremony that I was a part of, so that's why it has an eagle on it. Um, but um, as previously I stated, that we increased our enrollment numbers by 14.1% this year. This was done intentionally by contacting counselors, deans, and principals at student schools. Through this partnership, they helped me send out 506 forms home to students and parents to complete and return. We also have increased our contact with Wake County PSS communications and social media outreach. We have implemented the use of the Department of Indian Affairs member in Power School, which allows counselors, social workers, principals, deans, and any other employees to immediately see if a student is enrolled in Indian education. So that if they need resources or um, if they need, they're not enrolled, then they can help them get enrolled. Um, I also have a wonderful parent advisory committee who works with me in making sure that Wake County Indian Education Program is successful and ever growing. Next is Mr. J.D. Freeman. He is the Vice President of our Indian Education Advisory Committee. Oh, hello, everyone. Um, it's an honor to be here today, and thank you for having me. And uh, on behalf of the Wake, uh, everyone who is involved in the Wake County in the Indian Education Program, um, thank you for having us here today. Um, my name is J.D. Freeman. I'm a Lumbee Indian. I currently live in Apex, North Carolina, where I have two daughters uh, going through the Wake County public school system. One is at uh, Olive Chapel Elementary and another at Lufkin Road Middle School. And on that note, I just want to point out, like, maybe you guys have some contact with the IT department or something, but um, I recently received an email that was obviously uh, an error because it was welcoming my daughter to high school. And, uh, <laughs> uh, you're right. She's, she's this small. She's not so small. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> But, uh, but I guess in all seriousness, though, but uh, uh, I need to be serious here, so thank you. But thank, you. <laughs> thank you guys for allowing us to um, hire Miss Becky Locklear, uh, recently Miss Gwen Locklear. Fortunately for her, but unfortunately for us, she reached retirement, was able to retire. And just her years of service and knowledge, we were terrified. 
Like, we're not going to find someone to replace her. And thankfully for, you know, uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Moore Lawrence, as well as Becky Foote, as, as well as other staff, helped field a number of applicants and participated in the interviews and were able to find, uh, find Becky. And our biggest worry with Becky was, like, we would not be able to get her to come here. Um, and, but so thank you to Wake County as well for uh, assisting with this, making this a full-time position. Um, legally and practically, we, were, we realized we couldn't advertise a part-time or full-time position with part-time pay um, because that's what Ms. Quinn was doing. So thank you for assisting with that. And uh, uh, Becky hit the ground running. Um, as she was saying earlier, uh, thanks. And her being able to talk with principals and get more of these forms filled out increase our participation, which, in the, which, is, which also increase our grant amount which is a good thing, so thank you for that. Um, and thank you for giving us a place in Garner. Um, we, we enjoy having a home that we're able to go to and uh, congregate with our kids and get to know each other, um, discuss our stories as well as participate in events uh, that uh, Becky previously spoke about. They want to make really nice ribbon shirts, um, you know, corn necklaces. We do a lot of beading. Um, we're also currently doing some language workshops and. Uh, allowing kids and parents to le learn a little bit more about some of our lost languages that um, it's, it's something that's uh, gaining steam across uh, Native American and it's great that here in Wake County we're able to do that. Um, and also thank you for the academic opportunities um, to introduce our kids to STEM and pharma pharmaceutical services. Um, I, I myself uh, grew up in another county but was able to participate in some of those activities and it just introduced me to engineering and I'm able to do that now. So I'm really thankful and I see that same thing happening with our kids. So thank you for allowing that. Um, I want to make sure I capture everything here. And as with most meetings our days, we uh, recently transferred to a virtual platform. Um, even though our Garner is somewhat centrally located, it's still a tall task to ask parents to drive there on a Monday night on top of everything else they're doing. Uh, so being able to do that, we have really high participation in that. We're able to have a open discussions and make decisions and assist Becky with making this, with the tremendous things that she's doing. Um, but that's all I have. And once again, just want to say thank you. And um, thank you. That's it. Thank you to Becky and JD for your comments about our Indian Ed programming. We will now move on to Dr. Kimberly Burton and Laura Abernathy Dune, who will share with us about family and community engagement. Good afternoon, everyone. Laura and I are so pleased to be with you this afternoon um, to share a little bit of, about the work of the Family Engagement Committee of Wake County Public Schools. Um, I will first share that the WCPS Family Engagement Committee is a diverse group. It's representative of school-based staff, central services staff, community members, and parents. In an effort to support the WCPS strategic plan, goals, and aims, the Family and Community Engagement Committee requested funding in 2023 to support professional learning opportunities for all Wake County staff as well as families and community partners. As you are well aware, Goal 6, Parent and Family Experience, states that families will indicate low barriers to engagement and positive school climate. By 2028, WCPSS will eliminate any disparities along lines of race, ethnicity, gender, and socioeconomic status. This goal, supported by AIMS 6, 7, and 12, led to our committee work. We have a two-pronged approach to our committee's work. First, our virtual learning series that took place between last fall and winter and this series will culminate in an in-person summit and if you will look to the front we have nice big posters for you and we have another one here um, so we're very excited that the series will culminate in the first ever um, Wake County Public School System Parent and Community Engagement Summit. Um, and this event um, will present an attendance opportunity for our school staff, families, community partners, and families to be at the same place at the same time, building relationships and working together. So the why behind this work and why the committee chose to begin with the um, series was because we felt that it was important to work hard to build the capacity among our school-based staff and our central services staff 
to learn effective research and evidence-based strategies so that we first understand that engagement, so that we best know how to engage our community and our families. So this time, Laura is going to speak to us a little bit about the Professional Learning Series. Thank you. Good afternoon, y'all. Um, the Family and Community Engagement Professional Learning Series spanned four sessions, so it went from November of 2023 through February of 2024. Um, and you can see our four speakers on screen or on your screen. Um, we have Joseph Washington, who spoke about his personal experience and the benefits he received um, from a partnership between his mom and his <laughs> elementary school teacher, Ms. Nancy Ogle. We have Dr. Jakari Taylor, Dr. JT. Um, he is a former principal, a current educational researcher and motivational speaker, and he talked about family engagement that he experienced at all different levels of his education. So he gave examples from elementary, high school, and undergraduate um, college. We have Dr. Steve and Dr. Margaret Constantino, who discussed the relationship between schools and families and shared their five principles to family engagement. And then we have Mike Andrews, who spoke from the perspective of a researcher, a father, and a Wake County parent. Um, he shared his dissertation and research around stories and images of black fathers in family school partnerships. So across these four sessions, our participants really walked away with increased knowledge on partnerships between schools and families, how their own efficacy affects their impact, and the call to look for strengths that families bring to their students' education. All of our sessions met virtually from 4.30 to 6 p.m. Um, we made a, an effort to be accessible for school staff on lots of different timetables. Um, and across all four sessions, we totaled 145 attendees. Um, so yes, like Dr. Burton said, this professional learning series really served as our launch pad for the Family and Community Engagement Summit that's coming in just a few short weeks. I'll pass back to you. So again, the Wake County Public Schools Family and Community Engagement Summit is not only the first of its kind in Wake County, but a learning opportunity for school staff, families, and community partners across all of our 198 schools. It is a unique representation of the commitment of the Family and Community Engagement Committee planned entirely by this committee in addition to everyone's full-time roles and responsibilities. So let me tell you a little bit about what you can expect from the day. The day will begin with a keynote address by the Constantinos that Laura just spoke about. They will also do a breakout session with participants around a professional learning text that they recently authored, case studies to engage every family. Over 30 breakout sessions will be presented during the summit. This slide notes a sampling of the types of breakout sessions that will be offered at the summit. 16 of the sessions will be presented by Wake County or North Carolina, North Carolina community members. 18 of the sessions will be presented by Wake County staff. Sessions will be interactive and relevant to both staff and families. Community partners will be on hand to provide information, share resources and information that connect our families and staff. The summit will take place at none other than Athens Drive Magnet High School on April 27th from 8.30 to 12.30 p.m. Special thank you goes to the Wake County uh, Public Schools communications team who has worked diligently to market um, this event. Registration links have been provided to school staff, central services staff, our families, and our community. Um, on your tables, you have a flyer um, that has a QR code um, for you to share. There are additional copies of flyers on the table um, for your convenience for you to support uh, marketing this event as well. At this time, we'd like to welcome our, our committee member, our very own Wake PTA Council member, President, Ms. Teresa Jones. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me to share my perspective. I have had three kids graduate from Wake County Public Schools, and I have been in the PTAs for over 15 years, both at the school and county level, serving as president of Wake PTA Council for the last two years. As council president, it has been my responsibility and privilege to serve on this committee and other countywide committees, such as the Family and Community Engagement Committee. I have been delighted to be part of this work, and I am continually impressed 
with the level of dedication, um, like Dr. Burton said, that of staff that go above and beyond their normal responsibilities to collaborate and bring together um, different departments within the school system as well as valued community partners. I have learned a great deal from this committee and I hope that school leaders and families take advantage of the wonderful opportunity to connect at the summit. I also hope that the summit is just the launching point for the school system's concerted district-wide effort to focus on family and community engagement as a pillar of the strategic plan. What I have experienced as a parent volunteer is that most schools have a hierarchical approach to family engagement and parents and caregivers are asked to fundraise and volunteer to meet the needs of the school. We have a system that relies on PTAs to provide anything from staff lunches to playground equipment and has served to further alienate parents who see PTA as a fundraising organization and family engagement as transactional. We know that our community has a great deal more to offer than monetary support and warm bodies. One of the most important lessons I've learned in this work is that there are so many families and community partners who want to engage and want to make sure that all students have the best educational experience possible. But most schools don't have the capacity to make that happen or to nurture that type of partnership. For the district to be successful in this effort, there needs to be specific leadership and resources beyond departmental collaboration. It will be especially important after the summit when excitement and expectations are high to provide follow-up and follow-through on the district's commitment to empowering family school community partnerships and all schools for all families. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Burton, Laura Abernathy for doing day, and also Teresa Jones for their spotlight on family and community engagement. Um, at this time, we'll transition to Level Up. Level Up is a high dosage tutoring focused on math enrichment. It's being implemented in over 20 WCPSS schools and spanning grades 3 through 12. Weekly students will be engaged in a minimum of 180 minutes of face-to-face -face math enrichment provided by highly qualified staff outside of the normal school day. The learning experience will include the provision of scaffolds to support students as they access grade level math content and above with the whole child's needs being of most importance. As you know, as you know, Wake Together is a collaborative community initiative. Um, this is another spotlight focused on accelerating students by bringing together WCPSS and various community organizations and volunteers to serve as thought partners, organizers, and implementers of this important work. One way that we have already seen the impact of Wake Together is via HELPS. Our vision for 24-25 is to maximize the Wake Together work to impact more schools, more students, more educators, more families, and more partners. And we look forward to sharing exciting updates on Wake Together's progress in 24-25. I'm now going to turn it over to Marissa Smith, who's one of our Wake Up and Read leaders, which is a part of our Wake Together work. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here to share the work, the collective work of Wake Up and Read and how it impacts the students of Wake County. Over 30 cross-sector partners are committed to learning together and removing barriers to ensure that all Wake County children are proficient readers. Wake Up and Read's work is centered around three major pillars. School readiness, that's a birth to five group that is working to grow their understanding of how to provide equitable access to early childhood education experiences so that children are better prepared once they enter kindergarten. Outside of school learning opportunities, that K-5 action team is expanding their knowledge of what happens during the school day so that they can then provide alignment in those outside uh, after school uh, programs and engaged families as partners. That action team is meeting families where they are literally and figuratively to learn from and with them as they navigate how to support learning at home. In the last three months alone, 
we have been able to leverage the strength of our community to ensure over 13,000 high quality and culturally affirming books and literacy materials were provided to children. 26 entities from, ranging from healthcare facilities to churches to community centers and food pantries have paired their services with books to and literacy programming to ensure that their services are not only broadened, but the overall needs of students and families are met. Books collected during our annual drive will support the free book distributions at 18 partner schools and 16 child development centers beginning May 5th, ranging through mid-June to promote reading during the summer and during trackouts. By the way, we're still looking for volunteers for those distributions. <laughs> The Reaching Families Raising Readers, my favorite, initiative utilizes intentional efforts to uniquely engage families as partners to foster literacy conversations around the science of reading and what it truly takes to be a literate reader. Our outreach efforts span across eight priority zip codes and afford us the opportunity to build trusting relationships with everyone from young fathers who are looking to motivate their sons to be better readers to the grandparents we find in churches who are seeking to find out how to better advocate for their, their grandchildren. As well as uh, the mother who was inspired by her learning during our parent leader network that meets monthly that she has started her own brown girl book club to share her love of reading and empower other little girls to be the best versions of themselves. In addition to in-person opportunities, Wake Up and Read promotes literacy through access to other family engagement tools and resources such as Parent Powered, a text messaging system that provides three texts a week based on literacy, math, and social emotional wellness. Those text messages are age appropriate and grow with children. They are based on a middle schooler's um, level so that all parents have access. We also restock 29 Little Free Libraries across Wake County monthly. And a monthly newsletter goes out with a growing number of subscribers. So as you can see, books are an essential part of the work of Wake Up and Read. But the true power of the Wake Up and Read Coalition is the shared learning, the capacity building, and the relentless commitment of families partners and the numerous volunteers to ensure that our children are literate. Thank you. Thank you Marissa Smith and also Liz Colbert who is our interim program administrator for Wake Up and Read. And again we are proud that Wake Up and Read is a part of our Wake Together Coalition. Our last spotlight for today is AVID. AVID is advancement via individual determination. Abbott's mission is to close the opportunity gap by preparing all students for college and career readiness and success in a global society. Um, Abbott has proven national effectiveness with 76% of Abbott seniors being from low socioeconomic status background, 86% of those being underrepresented students, but nevertheless, those students outperform their peers in crucial metrics nationwide. 94% of them complete a four-year college entrance requirement, 90% apply and are accepted into four-year colleges, and 84% of those who are accepted enroll in college persisting into the second year. For the 23-24 school year, we're excited to have the opportunity to implement Abbott at the following six schools. Staff receive training on the Abbott College and Career Readiness Framework. Students receive access to tools that accelerate their preparation for college and career. And families are partners who help to ensure that students maximize those Abbott offerings provided and that families also have what they need to impact their students' outcomes and we will have further expansion into some additional schools for 24-25. As you can see, K-12 Academic Enhancement Extended Learning Opportunities 
are plentiful and we look forward to continued success. Thank you. So we had an opportunity to share with many programs that we have in place to really begin to look at how do we live up to the opportunity to access equity for all students. And so we shared a highlight of some of these programs. Some of them are uh, deeply entrenched in the work and we're continuing to enhance them. Some of them are new and we're working to strengthen those programs. So we will take any questions that you guys have. Thank you all so much for the overview that you all have provided for us, the great work that we don't get to see at the day, every day, but knowing that the great work is happening, it's always great to learn about that. Um, and I would say, Dr. Rose Norman, hopefully next year we can bring some students to hear about their experience with Abbott um, so we can learn more and see how we can potentially get this in all of our schools. Uh, but I'll open up with some questions. I saw Chair Haggerty and then Ms. Hirsch. Thank you, Mr. Swanson. So with a lot of these different extended learning opportunities, you know, there's a lot of different individual programs that each fill a need. Where does the funding for these programs typically come from? Is it more grant funding? Is it funding that we get from our local county? Or is state money provided through our allocations? Probably a little bit of both. Well, some things start with grant funding, and based on its success, we may begin to look at moving it to uh, local funding or some federal funding, some type of funds in which we have. Um, and that's why many of these things are small, to kind of do a proof of concept to make sure that they're worth funding. I don't know, Drew, if you want to add to that? I, I think a little bit of everything. And, you know, I think one of the things that hopefully is a takeaway from today, I think some of these programs, I think you all recognize, we've brought updates on periodically, but they're independent from one another. I hope what the takeaway, one of the takeaways is today is that you see this is now under one consolidated umbrella uh, in Dr. Moore Lawrence's academic enhancement team. And so I think when we're talking about funding and other efficiencies, it provides us an opportunity to look at the whole picture. And as Dr. Wilson Norman, or excuse me, um, as Dr. Wilson Norman was just describing, identify the best funding source at the time based on what the parameters of that source are and then match that with the need in a way that maybe we haven't been able to do historically when some of these programs might be attached to other departments. Yeah. And so um, hopefully that's part of what you see today is these now fall under one umbrella and whether it's Title I, um, other federal funding sources like Title II, Title IV, DSSF, and local funds, the idea is, is to be more strategic um, and enhance the impact of each of these programs individually but also collectively. Thank you. Can you explain a little bit more about AVID? Because I saw elementary school, some middle school, some high schools. Is it like a, if you start in elementary school, are you going to flow through it through from Lynn, Lynn Road Elementary to wherever they might go to middle school into Sanderson? Yes, so Dr. Wilson Norman shared that we're scaling up some of these initiatives. So right. these six schools were our initial pilot. And okay. in the future, we're looking at building a forecast for them to transition from elementary to middle and high. Um, okay. We do have an Eastern Wake. Next year's preview for 24-25 is that we will have a model that will have middle and high as a feeder pattern, That's and then okay. we'll add elementary. Thank you so much. Sure. Appreciate it. Mr. Hershey, I'll just add to that, too, yep. going back to the efficiency and under one umbrella piece, right? The other thing that this does is allow us to better monitor progress and data points with um, Dr. Moore Lawrence's team in terms of making adjustments, providing the training where it's needed. Mm -hmm. um, I think a common refrain over the years sometimes has been, we, we don't always know whether it's the program or the implementation. And so I think this is another opportunity for us to focus on implementation so that we can monitor results and know that we can make adjustments right. and it's not necessarily um, a lack of consistent implementation right. when we might not see the results we want to see, as right. opposed to the program itself. That's great. I just want to say thank you for bringing AVID to Wake County Public Schools or back to Wake County Public Schools. Um, my college roommate was the AVID coordinator at a, another district in another state and I got to hear all the great things that she was able to do with her kids. And, just very excited to see it get started and know that it's going to expand. So thank you. Now, I just echo those sentiments. Um, myself and another former board member are very familiar with it and advocated very deeply to G. Ellis to bring AVID to our district. So I'm definitely well, I think she advocated back and, and is here. <laughs> so I peeked over. I was like, oh, well, we spent a lot of time on why we should be bringing AVID. <laughs> Is there any other 
Yes, Dr. Reed. Um, this is actually a question from Ms. Jones. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, what kind of efforts are you, um, you, you mentioned about trying to um, go away from that, that idea of the PTO being a, a fundraising organization. I mean, what, can you give some kind of ideas or how you go about doing that? Well, I think if there's kind of a um, double-edged sword with that, right? Like many schools have, there has been this expectation that has built up from administration that PTA will help supplement um, anything from new playground equipment to monthly lunches for staff to um, professional development and things like that, where the PTA then feels the responsibility to raise more money to provide that for the school because everybody wants their school to be great and to be able to provide what the staff needs. Um, but it moves away from the real purpose of PTA, which is to advocate. And then there isn't that sense where um, parents are partners with the school, right? They're there to provide a service, either to raise money or to volunteer at events. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily the PTA's responsibility. I think it has to come from the top down, from the school administration to say, we want to be equal partners with you and your child's education. And PTA was essential in stopping or mitigating the class size, K-3 class size law back when that was happening. I know there was a lot of advocacy around that. So um, for as bad as it is, I guess it could have been worse. So. That was a question. Yes. Um, thank you, Dr. Ng. I just, I just told Chair, you teed me up for Elevate, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which is a partnership with Activate Good, which, again, credit to yet another wonderful former board member. Um, I have had great board members who have dragged me along into a lot of good things. Um, but And, of course, thank you, Ms. Jones, for the work that you do. I, I think the other piece that I would add for PTA that I think can be valuable, and many of you know, um, when my daughter entered middle school, we entered to a school that didn't have a PTA. My husband, who had never been on PTA, had to be on PTA because I was on the school board. Um, but our goal, to your point, was not about fundraising. It was about ensuring parents understood what was happening in those buildings. So yes, legislative advocacy is important, but for me, it was also the advocacy in that building on behalf of those students so that families were, which we heard very well, um, I, I think, families or schools without PTAs, the benefits that we heard earlier about what's happening in our buildings with family engagement is bringing families into school, but that wasn't the case. Um, and that's why we're talking about it today, because it has not always been the ways in which we were engaging families who didn't have complete access and resources to our schools. So I also lift up that PTA serves a valuable place for me for helping parents understand what's happening. In those. So math night, yes, it's happening at that school, but one of the things that was important for me is that PTAs partnered with that to ensure that those families could get there. And then lastly, the Elevate project with Activate Good was for me a beginning step to show that there are ways to bring resources into the schools, especially when parents don't have those resources, and that's really highlighting, and all of you know is Ms. Cash, who drove the message home all the time, that we were missing the opportunity on public-private partnerships. And that's what this has proved. I mean, we're now up to 15 schools, and thank you, Ms. Mwanda. We are begging schools to apply so we can keep this project going. So I look at her because she sent me emails like, I got it in! Um, because it is important to me that we have these um, um, businesses now invested, to your point, in helping with resources because that should not necessarily be shouldered on the burdens of parents so that they can't feel that they can be engaged in their school. So that's one thing that we hope to alleviate with this new transition of bringing in partnerships where, yes, a bank can come in and do all these things and help bring financial resources while PTAs can help build our families' advocacy skills and community and help our family engagement to say, this is your school and this is about building school community. So thank you, Ms. Jones, for all that you've done, but also always lifting up that this is not just about fundraising, which is how people have seen PTA for probably my entire life. <laughs> well, thank you all so much for a great discussion and I do want to make um, I noticed on the agenda we only have one more Student Achievement Committee meeting, and that's going to be May 14th. Yes. Um, we have pulled the June one because, you know, June is such a busy month, and I did not want to have staff going from the Convention Center here. So <coughs> May 14th will be our last 
Student Achievement Committee, and we have 10 minutes to spare to our work session. So I'm going to adjourn this meeting at 2.20. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah.